Glory to God. Well, we're in this series on uh, sharing the gospel, and uh, we're going to move in a slightly different direction today and talk about the spiritual warfare, because whether you know it or not, you are in the middle of a spiritual warfare. And uh, in fact, there's a spiritual warfare going on over every soul, every person. And uh, the battle is on between God, the kingdom of God, and Satan, and the kingdom of darkness. Whether you're aware of it or not, this is the reality. And um, there's a battle over your soul, each and every soul. And the, the, the basic issue is, are you for God? Or are you for Satan's way? Are you to be God-centered? Or are you to be self-centered? Is God to be your God? Or are you going to be your own God? And of course, um, this, this battle, whether we realize it or not, is, is, is going on all the time. And if once we are born again, praise God, we change sides in that battle. We are translated out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God. And now we are to play a role in this spiritual warfare. And a major part that we do that is through sharing the gospel. Um, so I really want to talk about this. But let me just say that when we're sharing the gospel, you know, what is Satan's main weapon? And, and I think his main weapon, of course, is deception. And in particular, because we were born into a fallen world, bad things happen, tragedies happen, all right? We all die for a start, which means different members of our family will die. We will all face suffering and tragedy and things like this. And so the devil is sneaky because he's the one that caused this sad state of affairs in the first place by tempting mankind into sin to turn our backs against God, and, and then that brought the curse of death into the world. And, uh, and, but then when these things happen, the devil gets into people's minds and says, oh, you can't believe in God, because why would God let such a bad thing happen to this member of your family or this, this one? And so the devil then turns people's hearts against God so that they blame God or say, well, I can't, I can't believe in a God like that. And that actually is his major weapon because bad things will happen in your life. And if you're predisposed to believe that lie of the enemy, then, then he, he's, got, he's got you. In fact, Job is a great book of the Old Testament, which is ultimately about this spiritual warfare, the spiritual warfare that took place over Job, a tremendous believer. And, and uh, without going into the detail, the basic issue was, would he stay loyal to God, even though it seemed like everything was going, around, going wrong around him? Even though he was a, you know, a good believer, as it were. Now, Job had his, had his issues. You know, he had his self-righteousness. That, that much is clear in the book. But the, the bottom line, the, the real test and the real reason why Job is commended, even in the New Testament, it, it talks of, in James 5 about the patience of Job. Uh, he passed the test because he kept believing in God, even though he couldn't understand why this stuff was happening, uh, and he thought God was bringing it all down on him. But even that, even so, he kept his loyalty to God no matter what. And a, and a true believer, and if you notice, all the men of God in the Old Testament, they went through some very hard times, and it looked like God's promises to them were, were not coming to pass. And yet they kept their faith in God. That's the real test of faith, is when things go wrong around you. When things, you're thinking, why, you know, why did God allow this to happen? In fact, that's exactly what Satan is whispering into your mind. Why did God allow that to happen? He can't love you very much, you know, or he can't be a good God, you know. And that, that give, if you are disposed in that direction, that gives you the excuse to reject God and become your own God. And... If you die in that condition, you know, woe to you, because you have chosen against God. You have this life, really, to make up your mind one way or the other. So this is a very serious thing. Uh, but what this message today is about is what part do we play 
in this uh, spiritual warfare. Um, but I would want to say, you know, we do get this question, well, why does God allow this? Why does God allow that? And, and of course, the answer is free will. And we have to be able to explain this to people. Free will in the sense that we have a genuine choice. Um, and the answer is that, for instance, when the original Adam and Eve chose to disobey God, chose to rebel against God, God had a choice at that point. What, what would God do? Because God could have judged the human race right then. He could have brought an end to it, and that would have meant no more suffering, no more of the stuff that we, we face every day in the world and through the news. God could have, could have solved it by just saying, all right, that's an end to it, judging immediately and removing free will. Um, because, but... He chose a different path. He chose to not move in judgment at this point. I'm glad that he did choose that. And because he respects free will, that's part of our dignity, he actually uh, allowed mankind to continue in their fallen state. And that means allowing bad decisions to be made Bad things to be done, evil things to be done. And, and of course, we see that throughout the Bible. The Bible's very honest about the evil things that, that man has done. And people will say, well, why does God allow it? Well, God will not violate free will. And if, if his choice, as I say, was to either move in judgment right then and stop the whole show, but then we would never have been born, or he allows the human race to continue in its fallen state. And meanwhile, he prepares uh, his plan of salvation to bring the Messiah into the world who would be the savior for our sin. But it means that in the meantime, bad things must happen. And it's not God's fault. And if something terrible happens, that does not mean that God somehow is allowing it, as if in any way he's approving it. In fact, he hates evil. He hates that terrible thing that was done against you. He, he, yeah, yes, you might say, well, in a sense, he allowed it. But only in the sense that he has allowed the human race to continue and not judge it immediately. And so you, we might say, well, why doesn't God just judge right now? Well, when he does move in judgment, then it will be too late for you if you haven't re repented and turned to him. Because when he does move in judgment, and he will, then it will be too late. And so the day is coming, and we need to be ready for that day and make sure that we have put our trust in the Lord. But th this is the basic answer, is to actually say, look, it's, it's a free will. And God... In order to protect free will and honor free will, he refuses to treat us like robots that he controls. He gives us that choice. And that choice means that evil is allowed to, to happen in the world. And so don't blame God when bad stuff happens in your life, all right? It, it is not God's fault, all right? It's the devil's fault, Adam, if you like, <laughs> Adam's fault for opening the door to that evil. But the God's only option was, as I say, to immediately judge the human race and stop it right there. And then we wouldn't even exist. So because God loved us, he planned a plan of salvation for us. Praise God. All right. So I just kind of mention that because that is the kind of thing that comes up. Because that's what Satan is particularly trying to get into people's heads. You don't believe in God. Because he allows bad things to happen. And everyone at some point in their life, something bad is going to happen to them. And if they're predisposed to reject God, they'll take that as an excuse and say, oh, there. But I'm, how can I follow a God like that? So be on guard against the voice of the enemy. Anyway, in this uh, spiritual warfare, we have God and his kingdom on one side, Satan and the kingdom of darkness on the other side. So what is the battleground? What are they fighting over? And there are two things. When a battle is fought over, is first of all, is fought over territory. And the territory, in this case, is control of the earth. 
and control of the inhabitants of the earth. All right? Both Satan and God, the spiritual warfare is who is going to control the earth. The devil's plan is actually to bring in his antichrist eventually, set up a one world government, and through that, actually literally control the earth and shut God out. That's the devil's plan. He's going to fail. All right, but that's going to come to a head for a short time in the tribulation. Uh, God's plan, of course, is to put his anointed one, Jesus Christ, as the king of the earth, the king of kings and the Lord of lords. So one aspect of the battle is literally control of this earth. The second aspect that we'll focus mostly on is the inhabitants of the earth, the souls of men. There is a battle over every single soul living on this earth. And we're going to look mostly today at Psalm 2 and Psalm 110. They are the two great psalms that are prophetic of the spiritual warfare that is going on right now in the church age. In fact, they're both set in the church age. Because in both of these psalms, the first coming is described and the second coming is described. And the placing of the psalm is it, it's about... What does God's people do in the time between the first and the second coming of Christ? It's a time when God's enemies are still active and where God's people have a role to play in the spiritual warfare. So we'll mostly be in Psalm 2, but you know, occasionally we, we, we might visit Psalm 110. <coughs> so let's go to Psalm 2. It's one of my favorite psalms. And of course, if you know Handel's Messiah... By the way, if you really want to be blessed, let me recommend, go on YouTube and listen to Handel's Messiah through, all right? It's just full of scripture. I think it helped bring me to the Lord um, because I just listened to it. I didn't understand it, first of all. And Psalm 2 is, is, a, is a section of Handel's Messiah. I'd be tempted to sing it to you, but I, I think I'll <laughs> avoid that. And so the, it's, very, it's a dramatic scene. So it's a dramatic um, psalm that describes the spiritual warfare. And so the scene one, the focus is on the unsaved masses of humanity. Why do the nations rage or tumultuously assemble and the people imagine a vain thing? <coughs> Forgive me. Why do the nations so furiously rage together? And why do the people imagine a vain thing? Ah, all right, enough. <laughs> but it's a, it helps if you've got the orchestra behind you. you know. But um, I've listened to the Handel's Messiah so many times, I can't help help it. Um, what, what is going on here? I believe it's the Holy Spirit asking this question. Why? And, you know, why when God loves these people so much, why are in, they in this state of torment? The nations are, are raging and the people imagining a vain thing. And first of all, you, you can see the nations all fighting each other, which sadly is always happening. They're, they're fighting because they covet, because they want more. They want more territory. And, and you know, the same th is true in our own life. When, as, when covetous rules our hearts, we are never satisfied. We never have enough. There's this raging in our flesh. In fact, Isaiah says that the wicked are like the, the restless waves of the sea. They, there is no rest for the wicked because we're constantly striving for something that we don't have. And... These nations are fighting one another for territory. And, and, and the psalmist asks, why? why is this going on? And then it, then it focuses on the people themselves. And they ma imagine a vain thing. Or literally, they meditate on a worthless, empty thing. And this is the second battle, is over the, the, the hearts of mankind. 
the souls of mankind. And, and they are caught up with foolish meditation on the wrong things. They're going into this philosophy and that philosophy. And, and they think that, oh, that I can save myself by doing these religious rituals. Or I can save myself by doing these good works. All kinds of, uh, you know, posturing uh, to make oneself look good and so on. And, and, and the Holy Spirit looks on them and says, what, this is foolishness. That they can, that they're, they're doing this. Why? Because why are they trying to live their life without God? Why are they trying to live their life without God's help? Don't they realize they're messed up? Don't they realize they can't make it on their own? Don't they realize they need to look to their God? Why are they trying to be independent from God? And so it's, it's a sad picture. He sees mankind under the power of the kingdom of darkness and them believing the wrong things and, and rather than turning to God. And in their covetousness, they're, they're trying to grasp after some kind of value and it's all useless. And that is the state of the world without God. And then the second scene in this drama, the focus now moves up a bit higher into the spiritual realm and answers this question. The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together. So the explanation given is that above what is happening, you know, the confused masses basically don't know what's going on. All right, but they're just subject to these kind of spiritual forces and to their own sin. But what we see in verse two, verse two is that there is an organized rebellion against God. And in particular, I believe this is talking primarily of the demonic principalities and powers, the rulers of the darkness of this world, the Bible says. Um, and he says, this is what our battle, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, Paul says, but against the principalities and powers uh, and so forth of the kingdom of darkness. And, and I believe primarily that the kings of the earth set themselves. They know exactly what they're doing. They are in organized rebellion against God. They are fighting God with everything they can because they want you. They want you. And they want to take possession of this earth. So they set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against. Now it also applies, I need to say, to human rulers who also, who are purposefully, not all human rulers are in this category, but human rulers that are purposefully in rebellion against God and fighting God and fighting the kingdom of God. And Because in Acts 4, this is applied to the Jewish leaders who had rejected Christ. And so when a, when a human ruler, as it were, takes up Satan's agenda, um, they are included in this because sadly, you know, if you take certain countries that, for instance, you know, atheistic communism, the rulers of those countries are purposefully trying to bring those people under bondage to themselves so they can control them completely and cause them to reject God. And they promote an anti-God religion called atheism. And so it also does include human rule, rulers too. But these people are those who are committed and purposeful in their rebellion against God, against Christianity, against the Lord. And notice, and this is where you come into this warfare right here. You might be surprised because it says, the kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord. Yeah. How foolish it is to make God your enemy. I mean, talk about who's going to win? Come on. Against the Lord and against his anointed. Now, the, this word anointed here is the name for the Messiah, the anointed one, the one whom God empowers. In other words, the anointed is God's weapon in this warfare. It's against the Lord and his anointed. His anointed is his representative in the warfare. The Lord sends forth his anointed. And in the Bible, the anointed is always a man. 
And now, primarily, this is talking about Jesus, the God-man. But the, the, he, God anoints his man. And that, that is the anointed one. And, of course, it's Jesus who became a man. His name is Christ, which also means the anointed one. But this is God anointing a human being in this spiritual warfare. And so he's, I like to say, he's God's weapon in this warfare. But you are in this verse because when you accepted Christ, you were taking, taken out of the seething masses of humanity that were in that darkness and you were put into Christ. You were put into the anointed one. And now you are in the body of Christ. You are Christ as it were in the sense that you are in Christ, the anointed one, the one new man. Praise God, in the new creation. Praise God. And so you are in that verse. This is what the Bible calls the mystery. Hidden in Christ from the foundation of the world. Hidden in God. That, that, that Christ, and we'll see how that works out. But So here you have this spiritual battle. You've got Satan, of course, and then the principalities and powers. And those human rulers who are in rebellion against God... And, and as it were, fighting God in, in the world. And on the other side, you have the Lord and his anointed, Jesus Christ, and all of us who are in Christ. We are in the middle of this warfare. Praise God. So it's not just about you choosing God and making it to the end of this life and going to heaven. You are immediately, whether you like it or not, plunged into the middle of a spiritual warfare and you are now in Christ and you have a part to play in this spiritual warfare. Praise God. And the, the fact that you are in the anointed one means that he has anointed you. He's empowered you to fulfill his purpose. Praise God. And so this is uh, the anointed one. Let me explain this a little bit because this is the fulfillment of pictures in the Old Testament of different anointed ones. In the Old Testament, there were really three offices that were anointed. First of all, the prophet was anointed by God. And the, the role of the prophet was to represent God to man. The prophet would speak forth God's message to, to men. And that's what we do when we share the gospel, really. We are operating in the spirit of prophecy. Revelation 19.10 says that the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Acts 2 talks about the Holy Spirit was poured out on all flesh that all may prophesy. That doesn't mean predict the future so much. It really just means that you are speaking forth under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. That's the simple meaning of that. And so... God's anointed each one of us to testify to Jesus, to speak God's word, to witness, to share the gospel. That's a major part of our role. In the, in the, and that comes under the category of, of the prophet. See, the difference in the Old Testament was only certain ones were anointed to be a prophet. All right. And then Jesus, the prophet, comes along, the anointed one. And then through the new covenant, he's anointed all of us now to prophesy, to speak under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. Praise God. We all have a role to play in that. So the first kind of anointed one was a prophet. The second one was a priest. The priests were anointed. And they, they were anointed to offer sacrifices of praise and thanksgiving and to represent man to God as an intercessor. For instance, the high priest would carry the 12 um, gemstones, which represented the 12 tribes of Israel. And he would bring them into the Holy of Holies. And that was a picture of him being interceding for his people. And we uh, are also anointed as priests in the new covenant. Praise God. And so the priest brings man to God in prayer and intercession. And they were anointed. And so you've got the prophet, you've got the priest, and you've got the kings. The kings were anointed. And of course, they were anointed to rule. And in the, in the Old Testament prophecies, there was the focus on that there was coming one who would combine all of these three anointings. 
prophet, priest, and king. And he would not have a partial anointing, he would have the total anointing. The Christ, the Messiah, you see. God's ultimate weapon in the, in the spiritual warfare. Um, Satan's planning his own anointed one called the Antichrist, you see. And, and that's, he's trying to prepare the way to get the Antichrist into the earth. But praise God, the Christ has already come. And the good news is that in the, in the new covenant, we are put into Christ. And now we also are anointed as prophets, priests, and kings. Not on the same level as Jesus, of course, but we have a part to play because we are his body. Hallelujah. So that kind of sets the scene of the battle. On the one side, the kings of the earth, the principalities and powers, including Satan. On the other side, the Lord and his anointed. But that's you. That includes you. All right. And now let's see what they're saying in verse three. We're seeing what these demons, what these principalities what Satan is saying, what their whole philosophy is. And that's the philosophy that they're trying to feed into the world. And it's this. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. They want to throw off, and the context is the Lord and his anointed. They want to throw off God's, God's authority. Why should I have to do what God says? Why should I have to obey God's commandments? I want to be free to do my own thing. I want to be free to define myself, you know, the way I want to. Let's break off. Oh, it's so oppressive having to answer to God, having to be accountable to God, having to love my neighbor as myself, having to love God. <coughs> it's so oppressive. I don't want any of that religious stuff. I want to be free to have sex whenever I want to have sex, etc. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. They want to throw off God's authority, God's laws. That's the spirit in this world. And they think they can defy God's authority. You cannot defy God's authority. It's like uh, somebody says, you, you can't break God's law, but God's law will break you. You can't break the law of gravity. You might think you can. You jump off a roof. The law of gravity will break you. It, the, the law will catch up with you. And, you know, every person who's rejected God at the moment of their death, they will discover that all their denial of God comes to nothing because God's got an appointment with them. And they will have to give an account to God, even though they've tried to escape from that thought the whole of their life. There is no escape from God and his judgment. And so they're trying in their desperation to throw off the authority uh, and the reality of God. And then the scene goes up, the camera as it were. It started on the masses of humanity. The camera moved up a bit higher to the principalities and powers. And now the camera goes up way higher. And we see who's really in control. Now we see the Lord's response. You might think the Lord's very worried about what's going on on the earth and what am I going to do with this situation and so on. Is God impressed by this organized rebellion? Is he worried? Does he think perhaps he might lose this battle? Verse 4. He who sits in the heavens. Well, immediately we're told there's somebody way, way higher up above. He's the one sitting on the throne. All right. He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. You know, if you, if you went into heaven in the spirit or something, you would, you would not find an atmosphere of depression and gloom. and you, know. you would find joy and laughter. God laughs and it says the Lord, that's Adonai, the Lord, shall have them in derision. In other words, he looks at their feeble attempts and... He laughs. It's the only appropriate response. They think they can beat me. I'm the creator. I'm the Lord. And I do like this joke that says, how do you make God laugh? Tell him your plans. <laughs> and it's so true. Yeah. Here's humanity striving. They're trying to get this. They're trying to conquer this territory. 
They're trying to do this and they've got all these plans. And if you stick around long enough in life, you realize if God's not in it, it's, it's not going to be blessed. It's not going to come to pass. You know, he, he waits till you submit your plans to him. And uh, then he empowers you. And then what you do will be blessed. But while we struggle, and, and I like to apply this verse personally as well, because it's, it's like sometimes we, we get so focused in our, on our problems and, oh, there's this and this, oh, I can't, I don't know what to do. And, you know, and if you were just to tune into heaven for a minute, the, the joy bells of heaven would start coming in your heart and you would start to laugh and you would pick up the, the joy of heaven. And God will be saying, oh, <laughs> does he think I'm not big enough to, to give him the victory in this situation? Does he not realize I've got a wonderful future plan for her, that I'm going to bring great glory out of this situation? Don't they know that I'm greater than everything that comes against them? And, and you will hear the laughter of heaven and you will start to get into a spirit of victory. But God has a serious side too. In the next verse, we see that God is not passive on his throne. In fact, he's not, you know, he has the answer and he has the victory. Verse five, then he will speak to them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. God gets serious. And when God speaks, the demons tremble. And what we're gonna see is that he declares their defeat. And... The next verse tells us what he says and as his final answer to Satan, which is the key to the whole spiritual warfare. And this is exactly what we should do too. Verse six, yet, he says, God's already made his checkmate move, basically, if you play chess, all right? You think, well, what's gonna, God's gonna do about this? He already has done something. He's already made the decisive mood move. He's already won the victory in the spiritual warfare. This is what we've got to realize. If we don't realize this, then our spiritual warfare will be a struggle and a toil. But we need to realize that he's already won the victory. Praise God. And we operate from that victory that Jesus has won. So what does he say? What's his answer to this rebellion? Yet I have set, or literally installed, I have installed my king on my holy hill of Zion. The holy hill of Zion is the heavenly Zion, the heavenly Jerusalem that's in heaven right now, and that's where the throne of God is. And what he's saying is, I have already, so this is in the church age, you see, looking back to what has happened in the resurrection and the ascension of Christ. In the ascension of Christ, God raised up Jesus far above all principalities and powers and gave him the name above every name and put him on the throne of God. Praise God. This is God's weapon in the warfare. The anointed man, Jesus Christ, who is also God, of course. But as a man, as the God man, he has defeated the enemy. And he has risen and he has ascended to the throne of God. And he is now seated on God's throne. That's the winning move. He has already defeated the enemy. He's already defeated sin. He's already defeated death. He's already dealt with every problem you're ever going to face in this life. And he has conquered them for you. And you are more than a conqueror in Christ. Praise God. I have installed my king on my holy hill of Zion. Job done. Victory accomplished. Now, there is more to be done, don't get me wrong. Now, this is where Psalm 110 agrees, of course, which describes this moment. It says, the Lord said to my Lord, Psalm 110, verse 1, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. And notice the situation here that this is fulfilled by the Messiah. He is seated at the right hand of God. He is in a place of equality with God there. And it, but the enemies of God are still around. It brings in a new period of time where the Lord has won the victory. He's ascended on high. He's in authority. But the enemies of God are still active, you see. But he says there is a future time when he's going to release King Jesus to take his authority 
and take possession of the earth and crush all his enemies under his feet. So there's a future time when it says, till I make your enemies your footstool. All right, he's going to put his foot on them and that will end them in their activity. That's the second coming of Christ. So do you see how the psalm here is also set between the first and the second coming of Christ? God's made that decisive move. His king is enthroned on the throne of the universe, but the enemies are still active. And meanwhile, um, waiting for the time when God the Father releases him to, to use his authority and take possession of the earth. But Jesus already has all authority in heaven and earth. He said that, didn't he? Matthew 28, 18. He's already been given. Philippians 2, 8 and 8 to 10 says that he has been given the name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. You see, he has the authority. See, there's a difference between having the authority and fully exercising that authority. He already has the authority. He has the name above every name. And one day, every knee will be be forced to bow. If you're wise, you'll bow your knee now to Jesus Christ. But one day, if you refuse to do that, you will be made to bow your knee. Because he has all authority in heaven and earth. And one day, he's going to enforce that authority. But then your days of free will are over. You will have made up your mind. So you have to do it now. There's an interesting uh, scripture before we move on here. Revelation 12 is a, is a picture of the spiritual warfare. Let me just quickly read through the first five verses here. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars. This is actually believing Israel, but I can't get into it. She, then she, being with child... Mary, of course, was the particular member of Israel who brought forth the Messiah, but there's a sense in which the Messiah was brought forth through Israel. Uh, She cried out in labor and pain to give birth, and another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon, having ten heads and seven, sorry, seven heads and ten horns, seven diadems on his head. This red dragon, of course, is the devil. So here we have a spiritual warfare. God is sending his man, his anointed one, into the earth, you see, the Messiah. And on the other hand, we have the devil, and he's trying to kill him at birth. It says, his tail drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. The devil took a third of the angels with him in his rebellion. But praise God, two thirds of the angels stayed true to God. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth and devour her child as soon as it was born. And you you know about the devil's attempts to kill Jesus soon after birth. But notice this, verse 5. She bore a male child, Jesus, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. This is the Messiah, the anointed king. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. He kind of jumps over his life. But the implication is he fulfills his mission on earth. All right. And then he is taken up to the throne of God. Victorious. God has sent his anointed weapon, the Messiah, into the earth to totally devastate and destroy all the works of the enemy. And to provide the total solution for your sin and for your salvation. Overcoming death. Overcoming every demon. Hallelujah. And then he rose victorious. What a cruise missile. What a mighty weapon. Praise God. But what about the time now? Because now the enemies of God are still active. Jesus is on the throne. So this is where his people enter in. Because now he has multiplied himself in us. We, when we accept him, we are born again. Praise God. We are put in Christ. And now we are anointed ones. Now the anointed one is still in the earth through us, through his people. We are the weapons of his warfare. We are here to continue that battle. <coughs> praise, praise God. And let's see that in Psalm 110. After verse 1 it says, verse 2, Psalm 110 verse 2. 
the Lord's seat at God's right hand until it's time for the enemies to be made his footstool. Then it says, the Lord will send the rod of your strength out of Zion, rule in the midst of your enemies. Notice the enemies are still active. But God's going to send the rod of his strength, the rod of his power. And that's uh, out of Zion. From heaven, through Zion, his people. Zion also refers to God's people. And so God's power is released from Jesus on the throne through his Holy Spirit. And through the name of Jesus, he's rod of his strength now. He goes forth to rule in the midst of his enemies. The enemies are still there. But we're going to see it's his people that, are, are, that his power is released through. Because that's in verse 3. Your people shall be volunteers in the day of your power. And so God needs you to be his volunteers. He needs you to surrender yourself to him and say, Lord, use me. Anoint me for your mission. Whatever you want me to do in this warfare, volunteer yourself to him. He says, in the beauties of holiness, or the picture here is a priestly army dressed in beautiful priestly robes because we are anointed to be his priests. Uh, and in fact, we are a royal priesthood. We are also anointed to rule and reign with him. Praise God. And we are anointed to speak his word as, as his prophets, as it were. And he says, from, in beauties of holiness, from the womb of the morning. And this is a picture of, of us being born again. We have sprung up in the newness of life. Uh, praise God. And uh, you have the dew of your youth. I don't have time to go into it. But the picture is of our rebirth. Hallelujah. With the resurrection life of Christ in us. And then he says, the Lord has sworn and not, will not relent. You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. And having shown this, this priesthood, we are now told it's a royal priesthood. Because we are not Levitical priests, as in the Old Testament. We are priests after the order of Melchizedek. Our high priest, Jesus, is a priest according to the order of Melchizedek. And the difference with Melchizedek is he was both a king and a priest. And that's why it says in, in 2, 1 Peter 2 that we are a royal priesthood. So we are anointed to be priests. Hallelujah. Especially when we volunteer ourselves to, to prayer and to share the gospel we are anointed to be priests, praise God. And to be through us, he wants to extend the rod of his power to rule in the midst of his enemies. All right, I realize I'm gonna to have to expedite here. Then, um, so what I would say is in our spiritual warfare, once we understand this, when he says, I have installed my king on my holy hill of Zion, that's God's answer in the spiritual warfare. The completed work of Jesus, the victory of Jesus. And that's the same posture we must have in our spiritual warfare. See, the devil will try and play mind games, convince you it's so hard, you've got to struggle in your own strength. And our focus should be just like in that verse. In other words, our focus is God has already won the victory. Jesus is the victor. He's already defeated the devil. He's already ascended on high. He already has all authority. That's our starting point in the spiritual warfare. You see, we take that position. We take that position that, 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 that it, there's no question who's going to win here because God's already made the winning move. All right, moving quickly now. Verse 7. The focus now moves to the, the anointed king, Jesus. He says, and this is what Jesus said at his resurrection and ascension, I will declare the decree the Lord has said to me, you are my son, this day I have begotten you. And in this case, of course, we know he's the eternally begotten son of God. We know that in a sense his humanity was begotten in the virgin birth. But this is talking about something else. Acts 13, 33 actually says that this was said to Jesus at his resurrection. And what... God did at his resurrection is regenerate his humanity. Hallelujah. He raised Jesus in his full humanity. He tasted death for us and he raised us up. Praise God. Raised him up. 
Hallelujah. And he's saying, you are my son. This day I've begotten you. And in his humanity, Jesus became, as it were, the firstborn from the dead of the head of a new creation race of human beings. Hallelujah. He's the second Adam, the head of a new breed of humanity. Hallelujah. So when you accept Christ, you are put in Christ. You are born again. Hallelujah. You are raised with Christ. You far above principality. You are seated with Christ in heavenly places. Hallelujah. <coughs> and so we can declare that same decree in the spiritual warfare. We can say, I am a son of God. And I am born again. I'm a new creation in Christ. I am seated with Christ in heavenly places. That's our posture in the spiritual warfare. All right, moving on quickly. And then verse eight is a classic verse. Ask of me, this is the instructions. Ask of me and I will give you the nations, your inheritance. Now, if you've got a decent Bible, at least it will, the, where it says, ask of me and I will give you the nations for your inheritance, that word for should be in italics because it's not there in the original. It was added by the translators, and sometimes that's absolutely valid. You know, sometimes a word in English needs to be inserted to get the full meaning. But I'm always very careful when there's italics, because the translators might get it wrong. And in this case, they have got it wrong. Because this is how it should read. Ask of me, and this is God saying this to Jesus, ask of me, and I will give you the nations, your inheritance. In other words, the nations of the peoples of the earth are already Jesus' inheritance. He's already, they already belong to him legally. Because Jesus, with his bud, purchased every soul of mankind. And he has the right to do with you, believer or non-believer, he has the right to do with you as he pleases. Because not only did he create you, he has redeemed you, he's purchased you with his blood. And... You are part of Jesus' inheritance, but in particular, those of you, you've given your hearts to Jesus, you, he's come into his inheritance. He's legally, you're legally his inheritance right back then, but the moment you give your heart to Jesus, praise God, you come in manifestation into inheritance. So notice it says, I will give you the nations your inheritance and the uttermost parts of the earth your possession." He's talking of two things here. First of all, the people, they are the inheritance of Jesus. Every soul you meet, Jesus has died for. He has paid the price for them. They are the inheritance of Jesus. And the reason we preach the gospel is we want Jesus to come into his inheritance, you see. And also, the uttermost parts of the earth, again, shouldn't be for your possession, but just your possession. The nations of the earth, the, the territory of the earth belongs to Jesus. And one day he's going to come in the second coming and he's going to take possession of the earth. But notice Jesus, first of all, is asked to pray. Now this is now the ministry of prayer and intercession. This is part of what the anointed one is to do. He is to ask of God. And then the nations will be turned over to him. The people will be turned over to him. And that's what happened. The moment Jesus ascended on high, he became our great high priest after the order of Melchizedek. And now he ever liveth to make intercession for us. And the reason you're here today and the reason that you're in the kingdom of God is because Jesus prayed for you at the right hand of God. Because he wanted you. You were part of the inheritance he died for. He wanted you and he made intercession for you. And through his intercession, he released the Holy Spirit upon your heart. And he strove with you from the day you were born. He was striving with your heart to win you to himself. And he used people in your life and different situations to bring you to him. Hallelujah. And that's the ministry of Jesus as the great high priest. But notice, you are also anointed priests. And this is, this is something we should, this is a basis for our prayer. We say, we ask, oh God. I'm sorry, I am going over, I, I realize that. Forgive me. Jesus said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me and I will not cast them out. The Father is handing over 
the inheritance that Jesus died for, day by day. And we have a part to play in this because we are the anointed ones in the earth. We are anointed, first of all, to preach the gospel because we have to take possession of the inheritance. You see, let me give you this example. When Joshua took the promised land, the promised land already belonged to Israel when he gave it to, through Abraham. They had it legally, but they had to walk with God and the presence of God. And through Joshua, they actually took possession of the promised land in it manifestation. And in the same way, you see, um, Jesus has his inheritance there in the earth, but we, uh, he has to take possession of it. In the second coming, he's going to take possession of this earth, but he's got to do it. God gives him, God releases him, but he's got to do it. And in the same way, there is an inheritance out there. Really, it's, it belongs to Jesus. It's his inheritance. All those lost souls out there, they belong to Jesus. He died for them. And we are to pray. Oh, we are to ask of God. God, give me the anointing to share the gospel. Give me the words. Give me the gifts. Ask of God. You can't do it in your own strength, but ask God to fill you with his Holy Spirit. Ask of me, he says. Give, ask for boldness, you see. And he will then give. And then as you go and share the gospel, you will actually, they will actually come. They will be handed over. And in a sense, they'll be part of your inheritance because you will have played a part in them coming to the Lord. So this is a, a verse for prayer. Ask of me and I'll give you the nations, your inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth, your possession. Praise God. And, and then just to quickly wrap this up. The next verse um, talks about, um, you shall break them in pieces with a rod of iron. And this is a prophecy that, of course, what Jesus will do. But also we share. This is the operation as kings. We are, an, we are a royal priesthood. We are in the anointed. We are anointed. And when we use the name of Jesus, that's our, the rod of iron. It really comes from Jesus. It's his name. But we have the right to use the name of Jesus. And we can break in pieces like a potter's vessel. All the demonic powers that, that would, would hinder the preaching of the gospel. Hold men and women in bondage. In our prayer, we pray for them. We pray for God's anointing to reach them. We share the gospel. But we're also anointed as kings to take the name of Jesus and break the power of the evil one. Hallelujah. And then we are to share the gospel, and I'm totally out of time. So, but if you read the remaining verses of the psalm, in fact, that's all I'll do is just read them. You'll see that the gospel, this is the gospel message going forth. Because we are, Jesus doesn't preach the gospel. Well, he's at the right hand of God, but he preaches the gospel through us. So we are anointed as prophets, as priests, and as kings. We're anointed as prophets to share God's word, to share his message. We're anointed as priests to bring people to God and to ask God to save them. And we're anointed as kings to take authority over the power of the enemy that's trying to win their soul. Hallelujah. God needs us to be weapons in his warfare. Praise God. He's already made the decisive blow. But we have to give the message. And here's the gospel message. Praise God as, uh, as we close here. Verse 10. Now therefore be wise, O kings. Be instructed, you judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear. Turn to God. Repent and submit yourself to God. That's what fear means. Submit yourself to God. Rejoice with trembling. Rejoice in your salvation, but with trembling because you realize it's not because you're so good. You totally depend on God to save you. And it's only through the merits of Jesus that you can be saved. So you tremble in your dependency on God, which you never lose, but you rejoice because he saves you. Kiss the son. That means worship the son. He's God. Worship him. Lest he be angry and you perish in the way when his wrath is kindled but a little. In other words, he says, don't waste any time because his anger is is, could be released at any time, like the fire that can suddenly break out. God's holding his anger back right now. He's holding his judgment right back. But the day is coming when his anger will be released upon the earth. And then it will be too late. 
He says, do it while you can. And then the final gospel verse, verse 12, blessed are all those who trust, who put their trust in him. He says, you're under judgment. You're on the wrong side of this warfare. But if you will put your trust in Jesus, if you'll run to Jesus and say, Jesus, I put myself into, under your covering, you will be blessed. You'll be forgiven. You'll have eternal life. Hallelujah. I want us to be those volunteers, you know, that Psalm 110 talks about. Realize that you are, you are brought forth from the womb of the morning. When through Christ's resurrection, you've been brought through into a newness of life as a new creation of God. And you are now anointed in Christ to be a royal priesthood and to be his prophets in the earth, to speak his words. Hallelujah. He's the anointed one, but we're in him. We share in his anointing. We are anointed to pray, anointed to, to preach the gospel, anointed to take authority over the evil principalities and powers. Oh Lord, we offer ourselves as volunteers. Lord, you said that if we ask of you, you will give us a part of this great inheritance that Jesus died and paid for with his blood. Lord, we want you to have your full inheritance of all that you died for. And so, Lord, we ask of you, we ask for your boldness, we ask for your anointing. Oh God, we volunteer ourselves to you that you would use us in the, in the reaping of this harvest. Send us forth as laborers in your harvest. Oh Lord, we can't do it in our own strength, but Lord, we ask for your anointing that you will use us Surprise us in how you use us, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, that we are the victors in this spiritual warfare. You have defeated the devil for us. We are on the victory side. But Lord, we want to play a part in, in, in bringing in this harvest that you have paid for. Thank you, Lord. Lord, I pray that you will use each one and you will anoint each one in a special way to play our own unique part. Hallelujah, in prayer, in witnessing, in ruling, in authority, in prayer, in Jesus' name, amen, amen.